This is the first. This is the first HI seminar series of the 2023-2024 year. So thanks to everybody. It's a great turnout. And as this is the first one of the year, I'd like to, um, I'm so happy to welcome Elder McIntosh, who, who's going to provide a traditional welcome for us. And Elder McIntosh, Chancellor of UNBC. <laughs> thanks. Adi. Hey. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Everybody has to open up their mouth. <laughs> Let's try this again. Hadi. 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 Still not good enough, but I'll accept it. <laughs> well, for those of you who uh, didn't know what I said to you, it's a decal word and it says hello. So I said hello to you, and you said hello back to me on this beautiful Thursday afternoon. Tomorrow is the first day of autumn, and uh, hopefully we'll continue the weather um, as we have it today for the next few days. So um, it's wonderful to come and be here today to... Um, you'll be hearing Dr. Shannon Freeman and Adernaki... Jibali. I tried. <laughs> so I'm sure it's going to be an interesting um, conversation that you will have today. So um, I'll get you on the stand, please. So we're just about into Friday, into the weekend, and we sure are looking forward to it. I'm sure that, you know, everybody's so busy and and uh, we don't get to enjoy the, the beautiful day that we have outside. So I want you to take a nice deep cleansing breath throughout your whole body. Nice deep cleansing breath. So as we breathe into our body, we connect to a deeper level of ourselves, which is uh, um, how many times do we go there during the day or during the week? It is about self-care and you being students or instructors, and we know how busy your lives are. And it's like every day you, you wake up to pressures and you have to find time during the day to do self-care because you need to be healthy and whole to continue your journey, no matter where it is or what, what you're doing. And so it's just to bring that idea into consciousness because we so are in the unconscious mode of doing everything the same every day. We don't change things. So we need to change those patterns and to be grounded and think about how our day is going to unfold for us. You know, we, every day, we have a new day. If you face the east direction, the sun always comes up every day in the east direction. And what does it do for you? It gives you a new day, a new beginning, and new possibilities. And this we are grateful for. And just think about the things. We can always think about the negativity in our lives and you know how upsetting it is. But when you wake up with a full heart, open mind and open heart and you find things in your life that you're in gratitude for that's a blessing and you need to think about that every day so we are in research and we're in health and and you're being pro you're promoting quality of life for older adults in the northern rural communities and how important is that it is so important because life um, is for the youth because it's all about technology, right? And then you get into your parents or your grandparents and they ask you, well, how do you do this on the cell phone or how do you do that on the computer? And it is so easy for you. But with our older adults, it's not that easy. And we need the assistance of younger people to come in and give us uh, a helping hand and how to uh, work around those technologies. So when your mother or your dad or your grandparents ask you for help, don't roll your eyes. 
say, I'll help you, you know, be free to help them. So as we breathe into our body, it also helps calm your nervous system down. And that's important because as we breathe into our body, you know, like sometimes we're up against the wall and maybe your courses are becoming too hard and you want to quit. Well, you just find that quiet space and you breathe into your body and uh, you wouldn't believe how it would help you to say, okay, I can do this. And we want you all to be able to continue your journey in a good way. So how many here know what Clightly Tene means? Put up your hand. Okay, very few. Clightly is a decal word that means where the two rivers join together, the Nechakla and the Fraser River, and Tene is of the people. And, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're a diverse culture. We're from all over, maybe BC, Canada, or maybe from <clears throat> across the ocean. And it would do you good to acknowledge wherever you are in BC, especially, who, and if you go to work or do research or whatever, is to check out the traditional territories that you will be residing on. Because we are in truth and reconciliation now. Mm -hmm. So how do you, what is your truth? How do you reconciliate it? And then how do you put it out to reconciliate with the First Nations people that are the first people of Canada? They're the very first people of Canada. How do you show respect to the people of the territory that you will be working, playing, and doing whatever on? So we, the Clightly Tene Nation, have been on our traditional territories for over 9,000 years, as proven by lithic evidence. And we know we've been longer, but by proven lithic evidence, we've been here 9,000 years. The changes that have taken place over thousands of years supports the enduring strength, courage, and fortitude of our peoples. Through what we've gone through, we had to be strong people. And guess what? We're still here and we'll continue to be here. <clears throat> our governance through the bat last brought balance and harmony with our brothers and sisters of other First Nations people. Clightly Tanese clans are Frog, Lasuyu, Grouse, Sutsu, Beaver, Sa, and Bear Sus. Through this system, we know who our family connections are. If you lived in England and your last name was Smith, probably have five, six thousand people, maybe more that have the last name of Smith. Are they all related? Do they know they're related? No, they don't. But through our system, through our clan system, we know who, we're, who we are related to. Through our oral history, the use of legends told of our travels, our hunting and fishing territories, our trading practices with all peoples. May remember and hold steadfast to what creators blessed us with, and that is our traditional territories. Our ancestors have always welcomed people to our territories on behalf of Clightly Tene's elders, our youth, community members, and chief and council. It is absolutely our honor to welcome each and every one of you to our traditional territories. All my relations must see. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so again, thanks everybody. To um, we're very excited to hear our speakers tonight. Um, my name is Leanna Garraway, and I'm the manager of the Health Research Institute. I, as well as Dr. Kendra Ferber, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, and Bree Loeffler, who works with me at the HRI, are responsible for planning this speaker series. And we are able to plan this speak, I would hold this speaker series from the support of several UNBC departments as well as Sun Life Financial. We host this series every the third Thursday of every month from 2.30 to 4. Our next one is October 19th, and we're actually going to be holding a co-hosted um, seminar series with Northern Health. And it's going to be an interdisciplinary panel, and the title will be 
Northern Health and UNBC working in partnership towards Health in the North. In November, we have Dr. Vivian Josowski. And December 7th, which is not the third Thursday of the month, but that's pretty close to Christmas, is Dr. Jackie Peterson. As well, we always have updated information on our seminar series on our website. I also want to take a minute to plug a very exciting conference that's occurring here on campus November 7th to 9th. It's also a uh, UNBC and Northern Health co-hosted event, and it's a showcase and celebration of research and quality improvement here in the North. Uh, registration is open now. Registration is free this year. We're, we're very happy we could offer that, but we do request people register. We need that for room counts, catering, and also a few things will be um, offered streamed, but in order to get the link, you'll need to register for that. Today's presentation, as Chancellor McIntosh said, is promoting quality of life for older adults in Northern and rural communities. We have two speakers today. We have Dr. Shannon Freeman. Dr. Freeman is an associate professor here at UNBC in the School of Nursing. She has expertise in health and social care needs of older adults in rural and Northern communities, both among community dwelling adults and also those in long-term care. She holds a PhD in Health Sciences and Gerontology from the University of Waterloo in Ontario and an MSc in inter Internal Medicine and Rehabilitation from Tohoku University, thank you, <laughs> School of Medicine in Japan. Since moving to Northern BC in 2014, Dr. Freeman has spearheaded and contributed to a number of cutting edge projects in the area of aged care. And that includes establishing C10, which is the Center for Technology Adoption for Aging in, Nor in the North in 2019, which she'll be talking about today, and AgeWell, which is a national innovation hub and collaborating center dedicated to enhance innovations and technology development and implementation to support older adults in Northern and rural communities. Our second speaker today is Adaranke Egboji, who's a PhD student in health sciences here at UNBC. Adaranke is a nurse in her, um, by training and has a special interest in quality of care and life of older people in long-term care facilities, especially those with dementia. Adaranke has two master's degrees, one in healthcare leadership and management and the other in dementia studies. And she'll be presenting on her work, e-readers for long-term care, which was conducted with funding from CTAM and support from COBO. So at this moment, I'd like to introduce, uh, invite them to come up. Um, Bree, may, can I just ask you to help me pop on there? I can help you. Okay, we're just gonna put on there. Just don't get presentation. The I stopped. Sure. Okay, <laughs> that's what we do. Step off. Right here. Yeah. Can you see the bleeding screen share? Is it? It's not screen sharing yet, so we just need to do that. Okay, first. Just <laughs> Usually we have a present. Okay. 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 Nice. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. That's fine. But you don't see your notes. That's so. okay. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, so, so good afternoon, everyone. So, um, I'm Shannon, and can people see us, Adaranke and I, online, or yeah. they don't get a picture of us? They get a picture of you. Okay. okay. So, tell, tell, uh, tell me if I walk off off camera and I can't see us. Uh, we are very pleased to present together today. We just came from teaching a class together. Um, that Adaranke um came to to help with our students today. Um, and we're also pleased to be joined by our director of CTAN over there, Dr. Richard Macaloni, who's waving from the audience. Um, so when in the introduction, when Leanna said, I, 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 I founded CTAN, it was a partnership. Rich and I, um, we created CTAN together many years ago. And so I'm really pleased here to be able to talk to you a bit about what we're doing at CTAN. And then Adaranki is going to share um, her her project that she's done, which is an integral part and one of the one of the the leading um, projects that we have in our in our center. Um, but I just wanted to back up a second and say thank you, um, Elder McIntosh, for you for your for your introduction. And you know the inspiration for a lot of what we do at C10, and indeed our very first project was partnered with um, with the McCasley First Nation where we worked at showing technology can be a bridge between elders and youth. 
Um, so the very first uh, age well funded project that, that I did was in partnership with uh, their health director and their elder council and their youth council and their elementary school. Um, so uh, definitely you'll hear you'll hear a theme today about how technology can be a bridge and how we we aim to support and build those those bridges between all of the wonderful technologies that are out there or being created um, and older adults care partners and, and our health system here that supports them. So the work that, that I do, I'm a social gerontologist by training, focuses on um, supporting older adults to live well, people to age well, wherever they may be. And it is a growing area of focus. So, um, you know, the, the, the population is almost expected to double um, and double very, very quickly. So these are our national, you know, high, high statistics, you know, by 20, 2037, there's expected to be over 10.4 million older adults. And indeed, the fastest growing segment of the population is indeed older adults um, aged 85 plus. But when we look at what does that mean here in the north, um, I've worked with the Northern Health Authority for, for many years and I've been part of some of their, their modeling um, activities to really predict what's going to be the, the, the need for health care and supports from our aging population. So these are our Northern Health numbers and you can see um, quite a steep, steep increase um, in aging up until about 2035. And the blue line kind of shows that national trend that indeed the number of persons who are over the age of 75, the proportion will exceed those who are aged 65 to 74. So when we talk to the health authority, you know, about how we can best support and plan and prepare um, persons in, in the North to age well, um, and we look at the, the increase in um, staff that are going to be required and, and care providers and informal care workers and the demands that will be on family to support people to age and age in their communities and age well, um, definitely we will have more of a demand that we will have a supply. So that led us to talk about other other opportunities and how can we support people to live well. And that's where it became very evident that technology will play a vital role in supporting aging, supporting aging here in the North, and especially in supporting people to age well um, at home in the community where they want to be. So we, uh, this is a Canadian um, survey that was put out recently by AgeWell, and it really debunks some of those myths and stereotypes we have about older adults and use of technology. So indeed, three quarters of older Canadians felt comfortable using technology and confident using technology, and also believed that technology had great potential to help them in many ways. However, here's the gap. Here's the gap in numbers. Only one in five of them reported that they use technology to support their health and wellness. So there's a gap between feeling confident and comfortable to use technology and recognizing the value and a real gap in people who are actually older adults who are actually leveraging the benefits of those technologies to support themselves. So a lot of people think, oh, well, that's because, you know, they don't want to use technology. It's a personal choice. They don't like it. We have this, this image, this, this, this stereotype of aging. And so I want to bring this into our northern BC context. So here we are, you know, northern health, we, we see these numbers. About 40,000 older adults are, are, are living across, across the north. And when we look at, you know, the internet accessibility, cell phone, cell phone service and access. So access to apps, access to computers, access to tablets. There's some real important barriers that all people across our Northern communities are facing and indeed are amplified, especially in our rural and remote communities. So across, and, and these are from the CRTC. And across, so this is the, the minimum broadband that, that, that all Canadians should be able to have access to. This is their goal. So almost 90% of Canadians do, but only 53% of Canadians in rural and Northern communities actually have access mm -hmm. to an adequate speed of broadband. When we look at cell service, cell service is almost 100% almost, almost of Canadians. But when we look at major transport roads and highways, it dips down. And indeed, we're quite aware of all of the challenges of lack of cellular service across our highways here in the north and in our rural communities. So the ability to access broadband in northern BC is very sparse. And this greatly affects older adults, especially those in rural and northern communities. So they may be indeed very comfortable and happy to use technology, but not have the necessary infrastructure to be able to do so. 
So here I'm trying to just compare across maps. So you can see um, here is the, 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 cellular, the cellular coverage and the phone coverage. And you can kind of see the spots about who has adequate access to those services and supports. So I wanted to start by debunking that myth that older adults mm -hmm. don't want to use technology. People in rural communities don't want to use technology because we always have to ask, is the infrastructure there to actually support them to use the technology? And indeed, when we talk about our northern communities, we need to think much more broadly about supporting that, that the enhanced um, infrastructure so that they may actually access um, the, the cellular and, and internet necessary to actually be able to use the majority of technologies. So we've done a lot of work with, with Northern Health and looking forward, what can we do? What can we do to address some of those challenges? And how can we better support the growing number of older adults um, that, are, that, that, that we know would want to live and age well in their home communities? here in the North. And without changes, those pressures on, especially on our long-term care system and our acute care system are enormous. And it's actually really frightening how unsustainable the growth in numbers is without the growth in infrastructure to match it. So that's a lot of what we do. We, we, we really search to really support um, our healthcare system, support care partners and support older adults um, as best that we can and try to make some of these technologies more available, more accessible and support tailoring of them. Because we see this gap between all of these technologies that are available and actually them being able to access um, here in the North. And you know, sometimes technologies do make it, but there's that fragmented accessibility. Right. It's not it's not as just easy as, as just, um, you know, walking down the street here in the example, you know, taking a hot air balloon costs a lot of money, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of planning. It's possible, but it's not necessarily the best way to do it. So that's where CTAN came in. We um, aim to be that bridge, to bridge that gap, to be able to support um, to support older adults, care partners here in the North to actually be able to get access to the technology and to support people who are creating and developing technologies and to be able to make their products more accessible. So a bridge that goes both, both directions. So that's why you can hopefully see our bridge and our connector in our logo for CTAN here. We aim to support aging in northern and rural communities by making technologies more available to support them um, here in the north. So we have a, a, a big focus on northern and a big focus on rural. And we are built on partnership. Um, partnership with Northern Health, partnership with UMBC, and also partnership with AgeWell. And AgeWell is Canada's National Aging and Technology Network. And indeed, Adirangi will be speaking at their national conference, sharing the findings of her work there um, next month um, in Toronto. To, because not only do we take ideas from the outside and, and bring them to Northern BC, but we also showcase the excellence and opportunities and learnings from Northern BC, and we showcase, we showcase that out. How do we do it? We focused on testing, piloting, implementing, and promoting new and existing technology solutions. We do lots of community education events, um, partnered things in small communities across the North, um, trying to raise awareness about what the different technologies are available and how they may help them. So what do we do? We co-develop projects. We establish partnerships. We work with lots of different age tech companies. Here's a few of them there. And we talk about global partnerships for local impact. So Wakar is here from business. And so we collaborate on lots of projects together. We have a, a new project collaborating between um, us here in the North and, and, and Japan. So we have lots of global to local um, connections and we are very interdisciplinary in our approach and we have some of our some of our wonderful master students in the back who come from all different kinds of educational backgrounds at Adirangi as a nurse some come from engineering some come from health sciences social work psychology um, we have quite a diverse team um, who are working on all of these projects our projects range in quite a few different areas to support wellness, because when we think about supporting somebody to age well, it's a lot more than just medications and care from physicians and, and in the hospital. We look at how technology can support people to be independent, how we can support people to be cognitively well, how we can support people who um, may have different kinds of um, challenges and conditions to live as well as they can um, with, with the conditions that they have. 
We have a lot of work that focuses on aging in place. Um, so if you saw our HRI presentation last year, we highlighted our dementia inclusive communities work, where we've been doing a lot of work in supporting um, communities to understand and assess how dementia friendly they are um, for, their, for their citizens. We also have lots of work that focuses on staying connected and, uh, and um, Adirondack will talk about um, healthy lifestyle and wellness through meaningful, meaningful engagement with others. So I challenge you to think about the breadth and the growing importance of age tech. Um, you know, when, when Rich and I started CTN and, and Rich, Rich goes back much further than I in the age tech world, you know, there, there would have been very few companies on this map. And indeed, with the, with the success of the AgeWell National um, Network, we are an innovation hub as part of this network. You can see all of the different companies and startups that are Canadian-based um, that, have, that, that, that have connected through um, and been supported through the AgeWell Network. And again, you can see all of the different theme areas from mobility to financial wellness to independence to um, health service delivery. And so you can really see the breadth of opportunity that age tech has to support people to age and live well. Um, and so regardless of what, what kind of academic background you have, there can be an opportunity for you in, in to, to, to connect in through our age well network. There's people from policy, people from ethics, people from healthcare, people from environment, looking at healthy, healthy environment, um, all sorts of things within, within this very broad, broad network. So what do we do to fuel this innovation ecosystem here in the north? Well, we have um, a demonstration and testing facility here. It's nicely tucked in behind the elevators there um, in building eight. We're building eight, right, Rich? Building eight, yes. And so it's set up like a senior's apartment. Um, so we welcome you to come in and play with um, some of the technologies and see all the, the, the cool and emerging tech we have. We can, we can test things there. And then we connect to um, a network of real world testing, testing sites. And so together, we really focus on building um, important partnerships um, for collaboration to find the right technology to support the right person in the right setting. And it's important to remember when we're thinking about older adults, they're a very, uh, hetero, uh, very heterogeneous population. So what might work for one older adult may not work for another. And so we need to have lots of different options and lots of different ideas to make sure that we've got that right match. Um, for the individual in their context, and it's at the right time, because the technology which may support someone to age in place now may differ greatly six months from now, a year from now, or two, two years from now as their, as their situation changes. So this is a picture of our demonstration facility um, here. We have hydroponic gardening, um, all sorts of great things. Um, so come and visit us. Rich gives lots of tours. Um, our students give tours, so come and, come and see stuff. There's a picture of Adirondacks Cobo, what she'll talk about in a minute there. <laughs> so how much time do I have left? I'm just looking at your watch here. Oh, no. Okay. So I'll talk about a couple of quick project examples. My watch died. So yeah, fine. this one too. <laughs> Sorry. All right. One of the things we really focus on in our center is research to impact. So we do research to help real people. Um, and we have the real joy and benefit of doing research where often we can actually see that impact that we're having. So we started out, um, this, is, this is some of the work that we did um, with hydroponic gardening and raised bed gardening in a long-term care facility. This is a great article we wrote, I see beauty, I see art, I see design, I see love. That was a quote from one of the residents about how they, they perceived um, their engagement um, in a resident-driven co-design gardening program. And there's, you know, I made a wordle of how they described their engagement in this program. So at the beginning, residents were not allowed to consume the food that they, um, local food um, that um, they would grow um, as part of their um, meals. But now um, they're able to actually grow their own food in their long-term care facilities. This is a picture um, of, uh, of, of um, a rural home in Vanderhoof. This is a picture of what it looks like in Gateway. 
And this is what it looks like when they're harvesting the food that they're actually able to grow and eat. And, you know, this project came and actually influenced policy to the fact where Northern Health saw the value through the research that they partnered with to create in order to create enough evidence to change their policy and make a real meaningful difference. And in the middle is John, who's been with us since day one. Um, and he'll tell you, you know, that this program, this all of this work has given him an identity and a reason to come out of his room. And he'll say, you know, everybody now calls me Mr. Gardner. <laughs> so, so, so John is a great person. Sometimes John comes in and co-presents with us when he's available about just how meaningful participating in research can be. And sometimes these small local projects can make such a meaningful difference for people. Another one of our students worked on the steady wear glove. So this is a glove for persons with um, essential tremor. And in her and in her work, um, you can see this man has uh, essential tremor. And so there was a glove that was developed um, by um, this gentleman on the other side. This is this is we have a version two of the glove, but it was able to support him to um, live independently, to be able to eat and drink, and to be able to do that in a public a public place where he would have confidence where he could eat and drink without spilling him on himself because he was able to use the glove. So our study here in the North looked at staff workload. So is there, is, is what is the impact about use of this glove on mitigating need for nursing care, care, aid, care and support and need for long-term care? And indeed that was a really great um, study to show for that company that there may be a different business model um, where health authorities can really, um, by supporting making this technology accessible, actually support individuals to remain independent for longer in their own home. We also have some work with a really great tablet. So this is the backbone of a hospice at home program. So right now they're supporting individuals to, um, to receive the same level of care as they would if they were inpatient hospice, but to die at home. And so through use of this tablet, it allows um, if there is a, a is there um, an event at home, something that is upsetting for the caregiver or the individual who 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 is dying, um, they're able to just simply touch the button and connect into their nurse or care provider who's on call, and that care provider can immediately see into that into that individual's home, into the bedside, and decide whether they need to come see them or not. So this technology really mitigates all of those steps that you need to go through for that Zoom call to set up, to put in the password, all of those things. Here, all you have to do is touch a button and everything is controlled behind the scenes by the hospice. So that's a really great project that we have um, underway. We also do a lot of work to support persons with dementia to age and live well in their home community. And just watching on time. Oh, okay. Perfect. And what time are we going to, Liana? Uh, probably around 3.30, so there's Perfect. time for questions. Fabulous. Okay, so we have a new dementia care home in Vanderhoof, and a lot of just different partners um, have been at the table to support um, this, this alternative model of care delivery. And so I'm going to just play this while I talk here a bit. Um, so you can see some of the pictures inside of a rural home. But CTAN has been at the table alongside many other community organizations to support the embedding of different technologies within the, within the facility to support and enhance the quality of care that's being provided. So here, you know, in, in the community need, there's a real challenge um, in, in very small communities to keep people um, to, to with, with complex health needs um, in their home communities, but having, them, having to send them to a larger urban center. So in this facility, the first floor um, is a dementia alternative care facility, and then the upper two floors um, are, are, seniors, are, are seniors housing. Um, so if you had a spouse who had um, moderate dementia, they could live on the first floor and you could move in and live on one of the upper floors. And so we had a real vision. Um, part of this vision was to keep people to live and live well um, in their own community. So this was a really exciting um, opportunity here where we really check in. And this is this is a building. So you can see the three different the three different floors there. There were so many challenges to actually make this facility um, uh, to support this facility to during during the COVID-19 pandemic. You can see here, and Adaranki has done some of her, her work there. It's set up very much as, as to support persons to live, to live and age well. 
Um, they do a lot of art, a lot of creative activities um, and uh, your e-reader program. And mm -hmm. it's really, really exciting. You'll share about how um, different people on different floors engage in that as well. So there at Aurora Home, you just saw Rich was on the bicycle, but here we have a, a, a kind of interactive exercise bike. If you come to our lab, you can come and see and play on this, um, where people are able to interact and, and you know, um, have some fun while they're while they're physically exercising. They're able to do this with a with a friend as well. There's lots of options on this. And we've created some local content. So here um, you can see they're definitely not in Vanderhoof, but we've created some content working with this provider to make sure there's rural content involved. We've done lots on circadian lighting um, as well. And then this is one of our newer projects here, which is the Tote Sleep Sense. And so this is a way to monitor um, not only if somebody is in um, in their bed or if they've gotten out of bed in the middle of the night, but it also monitors um, heart rate, breathing rate. And we're looking at this as a big project with interior health, looking at enhancing quality of sleep for people in long-term care. Um, and so again, these technologies, we have them in our lab and you're welcome to come and see them. And so I guess that what I just wanted to do was kind of give you an overview of our center, which really we focus on having a partnered, a partnered approach because we want technologies um, to enable, to empower, and to engage um, people here in the North, well, it, whether it's individuals who are uh, older adults themselves, their care partners and family who may support them, or a health system that supports them as well. And so one of our fabulous partner projects is Adirankis Project. So I will stop talking and I'll pass it over to you to share a bit about your, your project. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. So once again, my name is Adirankis Agoji, and um, I'll be presenting my uh, one of my projects because it's a series of projects anyway, because it was done in long-term care in the community and um, uh, assisted um, living facilities. So but for today, I'm going to focus on the long-term care facilities. And um, before I dive in into the presentation, this is just you know a brief introduction about myself. And that's me there, you know, that's where it all started. I graduated in the year. Okay. So I, I graduated in the year 1997, you know, with a diploma in nursing, then moved on to um, acquire my bachelor in nursing in the year 2008. Then from then onward, I got a master's degree in leadership and hospital management and master's in dementia studies. And here I am today, you know, in UMBC. And um, just to kind of um, uh, uh, describe what my motivation was, you know, continue my academic journey without stopping, you know. And that's because I wanted to impact life. You know, I believe as a nurse, sometimes we walk on the floor, but then like you don't really see things, you know, out, outside your own scope. So, but um, I was so lucky when I did my BSc nursing, I took on a project that really impacted life. And since then, I just made up my mind that I'm going to use, you know, all my skill, my knowledge, you know, to help people, you know, even apart from the clinical practice, I know that there are other ways we can impact people. And that's true research as well, you know, bringing in information that people might not even think about, you know. So that's how my journey started. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, so um, I, I, I was talk, talking about long-term care facilities. So these are uh, designed to provide specialized care to individuals who can no longer live independently due to health or mobility issues. Uh, you know, like I know everybody wants to stay in their own home, you know, especially uh, older adults, they want to stay in their own home, but then, there could be situations where people have to move out of their own homes. And um, one of my own philosophy as a nurse is that wherever you are, whether you're at home, you are in the hospital or you're anywhere, you sh that quality of care and quality of life, you know, you deserve it. So, and that's why my own motivation is that when people are in an ins institutional setting, they should still get the best care they deserve, you know. If, you know, and that should, there shouldn't be any difference between people living in their own home and people living in 
institutional settings. So here um, um, in, North, in, in the North, we have um, 25 long-term care facilities, which are being operated by Northern Health. And um, Northern Health is divided into three health service delivery areas, the Northwest, Northeast, and the Northern Interior. So basically my work was done in the Northern Interior, which is, uh, and I would say that's uh, Prince George, sorry, Prince George and um, Quinell. So I started off with Quinell because that's where I live. And then we rolled it to uh, Prince George. So here, and um, if you can think or remember my topic, can anyone remember that? Improving the long-term care. <laughs> no, not <laughs> improving apathy, exactly. So I'm sure that term or concept, I'm not sure if it's familiar to everyone or you are just hearing it for the first time. So that's why I just took some effort to explain it here. So apathy is a complex um, uh, construct or phenomenon, you know. It's very close to dementia, I mean, depression, and all, almost often, you know, overlap with um, dementia. But the, there is um, evidence that is different from depression. In fact, if people with depression were given, I mean, people with apathy were given the uh, depression medication, they are going to go worse. Mm -hmm. So, and um, the problem we have, is that, and I think um, in clinical setting, especially, you know, long-term care, acute, yeah, acute care setting, or, you know, the, the, I mean, the inpatient or outpatient setting, you know, the problem we have is that apathy is not yet defined. Like, you know, depression, when I say depression, everybody understand what depression looks like and, you know, what it means. But for apathy, you know, there's still kind of debate going on at the moment that what, what is it, or what is it exactly? But then the evidence we have is that it's different from depression and that, you know, um, it, it, it is defined as a loss of motivation characterized by lack, lack of interest or involvement in usual activities, which means that those people that are affected, they lose interest in things, maybe things they've been enjoying before, or maybe wanting to try new things. So that is how we can define apathy for now. Work is still going on, and uh, I'm sure maybe in the next 10 years, you know, apathy will be one of those concepts that, um, you know, we really gain traction, and people can really look into uh, uh, a serious solution to it. So. Now, um, another evidence we have is that it affects four distinct parts, and that's the cognition, the behavior, emotion, and social and interaction. So, but for my study, I only focus on the behavior and the social dimension of apathy, and because these are the ones that you can easily see. So for the cognition or emotion, like you cannot quantify that, but you know, for behavior, you can see somebody, maybe somebody has been, I mean, up and going, and now the person is now reducing their interest in what you are doing, then you can easily notice the difference. So that's why I focus on that. So why should we care about apathy? There is evidence that among long-term care facility residents, the prevalence, the prevalence ranges between 27% and 84%. That is like four people out of five we have apathy in long-term care. So, and that depends on the type of measurement skill and disease diagnosis for uh, people with dementia. I, I would say the, the, the prevalence is even up to 96%, which means that almost everyone that have dementia living in long-term care facilities will have apathy not depression, even though it's often mistaken for depression, but it's not, it is apathy. So apathy can lead to severe disability, high mortality rate. In fact, there was a study that was done in long-term care facility that says that those that have um, apathy, they are two, like almost three times likely to die early 
compared to those who do not have apathy. And we see that for people that have apathy, apathy you know, it, they, um, they, they, they could, um, I mean, for care staff, you know, it could lead to heavy workload because people that have apathy are very, um, like, resistant to care. They are very resistant to care because they don't want to do anything. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, you know, they don't want to do anything. They just want to sit down or maybe lie down in bed and they don't want to get up. So that's why, you know, that could be a problem for the caregiver. So, but the good news is apathy is treatable. And in fact, it's preventable. Yeah. So, and that could be done pharmacologically or non-pharmacologically. So, and um, while researching the literature, I discovered that the non-pharmacological interventions were more effective than medication. And um, uh, so when I started my PhD, my PhD uh, proposal, I was, because I knew this is a problem that needed, you know, a solution. And I was thinking that what can we do, you know, to help people in long-term care, you know, um, to overcome apathy. So a lot of ideas were coming. So, but then in the literature, I couldn't really find any simple technology that doesn't require any expert input, you know, to implement, you know, as part of my project. So that's where the idea I was discussing with, <laughs> I remember that time. So I told her, I said, I needed a simple technology, something that, I don't need to go and hire anyone to help me to do the project. I want to do it by myself. And even possibly the resident themselves, they can use the, you know, that they can do it themselves without anybody helping them. And that was the, where the idea of Kobo came about. And um, that's where we are today. So, oh, sorry. Oh. Anyway, so that led, led me to my research question, and the, where the first thing I wanted to know that it, well, the Kobo e-reader, that's implementation of e-book club, can it help people with self-reported property? And then the other one is that, I mean, the other question is that, what are the other benefits of the e-book club to older adults in long-term care? And lastly, I wanted to know the experiences of those who participated in the ebook club. So, and the, that led to my three objectives, which is to explore the impact of participation in an ebook club on self-reported apathy, examine other benefits of participation in an ebook club, and then describe the experiences of older adults with self-reported apathy who participated in an ebook club. So the methodology I employed was um, quasi-experimental pre-post intervention study. And um, the setting, as I said, I, the, it was carried, the, the project was carried out in four long-term care facilities. And that's one in Queen Air and three here in Prince George. The inclusion criteria for my research was interest in reading. We were very particular because, you know, using the e-book club, I mean, e-reader means that you, you should be interested in reading or maybe you are willing to read, you know, for engagement. So then the second one is that they should be able to give consent and they can read and speak in English and are willing to use technology because I was looking for a technology that we can use. So of course, anyone that wants to participate has to be willing to use technology. And my exclusion criteria was um, uh, people with severe dementia, basically. And um, my sampling technique was purposive sam sampling technique because that will allow me to choose people based on my inclusion criteria. So um, apathy, like I said, apathy measure I use, you know, Currently, there's, I would say there's no tool that is being validated for long-term care facilities in Canada because I look at all their assessment um, uh, tools. I couldn't find apathy tool. So this, um, the GDS-3, uh, it's um, a research, I mean, a tool that is being used in research. So I decided that I will use that as well. 
So um, here's my uh, the process of my research. Number one is to secure sponsorship here from Kobo uh, through the help of CITAN. I went through CITAN and I was very lucky. They gave us a lot of Kobo, so I'm so happy with that because you know without them, this project wouldn't have been possible today. So, and then we connected with uh, research partners in Northern Health. I, I remember we first of all met the manager, the recreational manager from there. She introduced us you know, to other people in Northern Health that we can uh, connect with. And that was very, very helpful. And um, then we got the approval from ethics and um, that was done through UBC Rice and Northern Health. And um, like I said, the implementation was in stages. We first started with Quinell. I recruited um, seven, seven residents in Quinell. So we finished and the program ran for about eight to 12 weeks. Then uh, we did the pre and post interview. And um, well, for the participants recruit, recruitment, when we started, it was a bit slow. I think I, we started with three, three people. But when they saw, you know, other people gathering together, they were coming, oh, can I join? Can I join? And I go, okay, come on in. So that was how we were able to recruit up to seven. So, uh, but for Prince George, I think the, the, the that was very good because um, the staff were very, very supportive. You know, they, they even started the recruitment before. <laughs> Before I got there, you know, they've already told them that uh, it, uh, that something is going on and everybody were kind of, oh, what is it? You know, when I came, you know, it was like, oh, yeah, I want to, I want to join it. I want to join. That was very good. So um, then I'll, I'll move on to the next slide. So my data management, I um, most of my recording were done because I um, I did audio recording as part of my um, data collection method. So I used my phone and also I used Zoom for some, and the transcription was done through Zoom. And my data analysis, I use Excel sheets to do the uh, the quantitative aspect and in vivo to do the qualitative aspect. So this is just the preliminary result. The, the project is still ongoing, even though, you know, like uh, from, uh, we finished with the long-term care, but um, we're still doing the community one. So this is the preliminary results uh, for the long-term care um, um, aspect. And the total number were, I mean, it was um, 20. The, I have 15 females and five males that joined the program. The age range was between 57 to 98 years. And um, the educational level, grade one to university. And uh, marital status, the majority were widowed. And um, in terms of the impact of um, the ebook club on apathy, um, at the initial stage, 11 people reported, you know, self-report ap apathy. So, but after the program, seven out of the 11 were, have recovered, at least they, they gave positive uh, uh, report that they, they felt better, sorry. <laughs> okay. okay, so the other benefits of um, the ebook club are improved social interaction, improved group activities, and improve access to books through um, the library. These are the, uh, um, the, the benefits that uh, the participants shared with me. And um, in terms of their experiences, some said it's fun and relaxing, enjoyable and interesting. What you try, easy to use. These are the main theme that you know, emanated from the uh, from the qualitative uh, aspect of the uh, program, I mean, of my data collection. Then the limitation of the study, the first thing is the type of tool I use, you know, because I have to admit that, because this is just used in research and, um, you know, like it will affect, you know, um, um, I mean, it, my, yeah, my interpretation of data now. 
because it's likely that it didn't really capture those that have property. Because if you look at those, um, the three questions, they are positive questions. So like people that have apathy and one of the problem with apathy is that people that have apathy don't volunteer to say they have it. Like if you ask them, they say they are fine. Because of that emotional, you know, in, you know, aspects of apathy, they will tell you they are fine. So most of the time is the caregiver or somebody outside of them that will tell you that, oh, I think this person is having some issues, you know, like it wasn't like that. But for them, they don't really, you know, see it that way. They are happy the way they are. But then like the impact on them, if it's not treated, that's why we are worried. So then another thing is that my sample is very small. So like we can't really generalize it. And another um, important thing is that all these people that participated, they are cognitively, you know, aware, like they, they are cognitively intact. So like we cannot apply the, you know, we have the, the, the interpretation to people, you know, that have dementia. And um, if we, like I said, it's very common with people with dementia. So, you know, like, we can really, we have to be very careful when we are interpreting this um, result. So, and then the majority of the participants were highly educated. So, who knows, maybe if people that are, <laughs> you know, that are not literate, you know, had participated in this type of study, the result might be different. So, and then what is the implication of this to practice? Now, I, um, from my own, um, I learned that the use of simple and low cost technology such as e-readers have the potential to improve apathy in long-term care, as we have seen in the results you know, I presented. And the implementation of an e-book club can play a vital role in, bring, in, bridge, in bridging the digital divide for residents in long-term care facilities. I remember there was a time I call one long-term care before you, you introduced me to Aaron Bond. You know, I asked them that, oh, I'm doing this project. Can I come into <laughs> to your <laughs> to your facility to do it? They were like, oh no, everybody here is uh, you're maybe that in their 80s. So they can't use technology. And I'm like, what? Did you ask them, you know? So I believe at least a simple technology because I have people that, that have never, like all their lifetime, they didn't even have a phone and they participated in the program. So to me, I'm like, that's very wrong to say that because people are older, they can't use technology. So, and I know if that technology is very simple, old people will, are willing and they are ready to use it. And um, E-book club can be an effective method of maintaining or increasing resident engagement in activities, particularly in a pandemic such as COVID-19. My uh, my project also, you know, started from the time of COVID-19, and I gave out uh, some COVID to some people at that time, and. Um, one of the reports that came in was that, you know, they were able to use it, you know, that it helped them, you know, to participate in um, activities. Maybe they would have been sleeping, you know, everybody was locked indoor at that time. So I gave us some at that time. So, you know, supposing there's nothing for them to use, like they would have been lying in bed all day, all night, nothing to do, but the COBO helped them you know, to keep active. At least they were reading, they were doing one activity or the other. So um, contrary to popular beliefs, older people can use and are willing to try out technologies that enhance their quality of life. Anything that will promote the quality of life of older people, of course, they'll be willing, you know, to use it. And um, now this is just, you know, to encourage nurses, or any you know any of our professional to participate in research because you know I uh, as nurses especially you know we need to participate in research. Number one, we are the is like we are the expert. We really know the patient because uh, looking at my own um own own, own study, I'm like if maybe. Uh, 
uh, supposing I'm not a nurse, like I wouldn't know this type, type of problem exists. Like I would never even think about apathy. What is apathy? Like uh, what what's that? You know, because I remember when <laughs> I was saying it to one nurse, she was like, "What's that? What's apathy? What uh, like what? How does it look like?" So because we work directly with you know patients, residents, so we know their unique needs, and it's very easy for us to identify gap, which you know we can use research. I mean research to solve those uh, problems. And also it leads to evidence-based practice. It helps us to develop professionally and through research, we can be an advocate. You know, uh, imagine there is no research, you know, all the policies that have been done maybe like uh, um, years and years back that today they are not relevant. You know, we will continue to use those policy, I mean, policies and people will suffer, you know. So, but by doing research, we can sh show people evidence that this, you know, is not the way it's supposed to be, that there's another way to do things. And, you know, uh, policymakers will listen to us. It also promotes an interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. I, uh, uh, to, to be honest, all my career, I've not really worked with um, REC staff, you know, like, one on one, the way I've done with the uh, co uh, with this ebook club. So this really helped me to collaborate, and I can see there. Like if somebody had asked me that, what's their job? I'm like, they don't do anything. They just you know like maybe put you know gather you know resident together and be you know. I I didn't really see value in their work until now because they were the one that supported me. You know, sometimes they, they will help me to bring out the residents, read to them, you know, sometimes. So, like, I really appreciate their work. So, and I'm like, if I didn't do research, I wouldn't have appreciation for that. And um, we can be empowered too. We have our voice. You know, when we are involved in research, we, we can put our voice there and, um, you know, it will really make impact. And in conclusion, uh, participation in an ebook club have a positive impact on residents in long-term care in the north, as it improves their feelings of apathy, increases their level of interaction and participation in group activities. It is recommended that apathy assessment should be incorporated into the care of residents in long-term care facilities in the north. And also, we need more research to really know, is apathy really a thing? in the north because as of yet we don't really we haven't seen the you know the magnitude of it so we need to do we have more research to really know that and also to know the risk factors and how we can prevent apathy in long-term care so these are my <laughs> references and that's <laughs> Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. No worries. Um. So yeah, Shannon and Adaranke are happy to take questions from the audience and online as well. We're monitoring online. So, yeah. is there anybody who has a question for either? Okay. Bukar. So is your study complete now uh, with this sample size? No, it, well, it's complete for long-term care, but um, I'm still doing it in the community as well. So, and I want to compare, you know, those so, uh, results. 48? What would you say? How many do you have in total? 48? Oh yeah, yes, in total, yes. 48. Yeah, we recruited, yes. We recruited what for this. Any statistical significance of the results of this sample size? Well, <laughs> you can tell them about phase, the phase one of your study because this is phase two. Oh, yeah. Okay. So tell them what you did first before this. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so from um, the phase one of my study, I used the Kai High data to look at apathy. And uh, what I found is that it affects both people with dementia and people without dementia. And um, in that study, I only use um, two variables, which is um, uh, social withdrawal and um, reduction in activities. So I, um, the prevalent rate 
of apathy in that data set was 14.8%, with something, yeah, there about 14.8%. So now what uh, my own conclusion is that supposing we have to look at the cognitive and the um, the emotional aspect of apathy, that's the four domains that are usually affected. The It's possible that the prevalent rate could be higher than that because most of the studies I found, uh, one was done in US, one in UK, is always in the region of 50% and above. So that, um, that's my own conclusion would be that I didn't be, I used the proper skill or maybe it's included in the assessment itself, you know, uh, probably the prevalence rate will be higher. So, and for this study, I think the, I think the, it is it, clinically significant because like if seven, I mean, seven out of 11 people that reported apathy at the um, initial stage, now reported you know, uh, a positive result, then I think that's a clinically significant. It might not be um, uh, <laughs> statistically significant, but I think clinically is significant. Yeah. And I would say um, in Adarathi's first study where she's using the Kai Hai data, um, I think you're the first person to make an apathy subscale yes. using yeah. the RIE yeah. MDS 2.0 data. Yes. Um, yeah. So we were limited to what we had to mm -hmm. make that that subscale within those variables. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But it it looked different than depression did when we used yes. the depression rating scale yeah, when right. we had the apathy subscale. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious whether you have, have thought about or asked um, people about um, using alternatives like audiobooks if they have visual impairments, for example. Is there any interest in that? Yes, but then, like, um, this is a PhD work, you know, I'm like, I just want to, you know, focus on one thing so that, you know, I, you know, I'm not divided in many places and then I can't finish on time. So, I think, because already I spent two years, you know, I had to be waiting to go to long time care. So, I think, I, yes, we have it in mind. And there's then, great interest, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely in yeah. audiobooks. Yes. Yeah, that's right. But, but to maybe tell them what, what some of the features were for the COBOL e-readers and why you felt and the, the, the participants responded it was easy to use. What are some of the features that the COBOL has? Oh, yeah. Okay. Good question. Yeah. Because in fact, um, number one, the COBOL is very light because that's one of the things is very light. And for people that have arthritis, they find it very useful because if somebody told me that before when the, or with people that have a tremor, like this is very light. So it's helped them. So that's one of the features. And then as part of the navigation, I think I would say that Kobo is built for old people because it's very easy. Honestly, the, yeah, it's built for them. So it really helped them. So they, they talked about that. As well. yeah. Yeah. I was thinking when you were talking, I use a Kindle. And, oh. and mostly because my wife had one and I want to share my breaks and stuff. But I was thinking when you were talking, the Kindle would be terrible. So yes. The one that I have, it's, it's heavy. The, the bezels at the edge are really thin, so it's actually hard to hold. Like, I, I'm i in my 40s, I have osteoarthritis, and I'm already having trouble holding this thing. Oh. And it doesn't have Canadian library access. Um, so, and that's another feature of uh, the Kobo. Kobo, yeah, you, you have Overdrive, you have Libby and Hoopla. You know, you can connect with all those uh, platforms through Kobo. Is built in it. Yeah. Yeah. And for people who have trouble turning pages, yes. The Kobo that we have has a you can you can you can touch the screen, yes. but there's also a button but, you can click. Yeah. So there's multiple options. Options, and, yes. And I think when we were looking at non when, when we were designing the study, we're looking at non-pharmacological, non-pharmacological yeah. options. Yeah. I think one of the key pieces was what's feasible, like mm -hmm. what's got a design that's mm. been thoughtful about mm. persons with. Yeah. with more than just vision problems. Okay. There's lots of vision. You can change the font size. Yeah, and yeah, even lots the, of vision. I have someone that is almost, you know, she went for eye surgery. Yeah. And she 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 was so happy. She, she's like, you are an angel. That's the way she said it. You are an angel, honestly. Because she loves to read. And she said for years, 
She couldn't read, but she always aspired to read, but because of her vision. So when I gave her the Kobo, she tried it. Glad like ninja. That's the way she said it, honestly. So, yeah. Okay. Was, was the book club portion also online? Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, no. We couldn't really do that. No. It was in person. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, mostly because I know in um, like adolescence, the more time they spend online, the lonelier they get. Oh, no. So, <laughs> and I'm thinking that um, maybe there, there might be similar, like I'm just thinking the results of your study, if someone were to try and implement it, they might, you know, think that yeah. That the book club portion should could could be online, but where we found out during the pandemic, if you spend too much time online, mm. you end up getting lonely, even mm. if you're doing. Oh yeah. Meetings. Oh yeah. Possibly. And I think in aging research, that's a really important thing to mm. to recognize. People can live in long term care mm. and be surrounded by many many people yes. all the time, every day, and be lonelier yeah. and more socially isolated than that's they've right. ever felt in their lives, even though they're surrounded by people. Right. Um, and I think when we think about enhancing quality of life and well being, not everybody wants to be um, in a group program either. So this this technology also offers them an opportunity to engage in something they may find meaningful mm -hmm. in their own way mm -hmm. um, because they kept the e-readers and lots yes. of them. The book club I went to in 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 Vanderhoof, yes. half of them had read ahead <laughs> and they <laughs> because they couldn't stop. They 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 were reading ahead and so they were supposed to talk about this <laughs> chapter, but. Half of them were way far ahead. Yeah. So. They told me, I'm like, okay, don't tell anyone you are doing that. Just yeah, yeah. ask cheating. Just keep yeah. it to yourself. <laughs> and you yeah. get a question at the back end. Okay. Um, I think if I'm wrong, uh, I just saw that you mentioned the word therapy module therapy. Yes. Does that mean uh, there are you know, clinical assessment for the community? Yes, exactly. Okay. So once you looked her out, uh, you found out that there were people who felt like they were on the Yes. How was that accessed, like by uh, verbal communication? Oh, yeah, yes. I did um interview. Okay. It was a questionnaire. So I asked them those three questions and then I added it together to give them score. So it and, kind of. And you measured, you measured similar to the RI assessment. Oh, yeah. Component. Of course. Yeah. The component, you know, that one is social withdrawal and yeah. um, reduction in activity. So it's very similar. The third question is Did you have, uh, are you full of? energy or something yeah, yeah so that's... we were limited um sometimes it's really challenging to work with mm. research with a health authority um and we weren't allowed access to their medical records mm. so we had to re-ask and we know what the questions are that they're asked during assessment mm. so we built that into our assessment to re-ask the same one mm. and since Adaranki is a, a, a clinician by training experience mm. in long-term mm. care she has those Mm. that training to to do a clinical assessment although mm. it wasn't their clinical assessment it was the mm. research yeah. components but right. it was one of those challenges in designing it because right. originally we asked for them mm. and they said no <laughs> no exactly the yeah. staff said yes but no, then the, they, then they, the they ethics were and operational no. people yeah. said no so yeah. we had to go back to the to, to, mm -hmm. to the design and that's mm. the realities of doing research yeah. in, in the real world settings yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah. Um, one question. Um, regarding your findings, if you for the clinical assessment that you did it, during the research, did you report your findings to your caretakers? Oh no, no. This is for research. No. Yeah. So you, no, uh, you will report it back in an aggregate. Oh, yes, yeah. exactly. Absolutely. When I, I mean, when I've um, done the because that's part of it. Non individual. Non individual. No, I'm not. That's the confidentiality yeah. for the for the clients that mm. we wouldn't person report their personal mm -hmm. identifiable information back. Mm -hmm. mm. I'm just wondering the clinical aspect of if if somebody is diagnosed, mm. in, you know, uh, with leaning towards apathy, is that something that needed to be addressed by their caretakers? Is it like at that level of? Mm. <laughs> Am I putting you on the spot? Yeah, no, no, I'm just, yeah, well, that, that's a good question, really, you know, but uh, I'm not sure, you know, how we approach that because, like, 
number one is not the assessment tool like and i'm not a worker you know like i feel and i just said this is for research this is not clinical we're not doing medical uh treatment here it's part of you know what we told uh, ethics so i can't really say this is not diagnosis no. It's just but, like, you, but yeah. your question is your question mm, is a, is a fair question of research yeah, when you observe honestly. something yeah. um that that you feel requires information mm. you, you you require that re re requires some kind of intervention do you mm. have a duty mm. to report that's mm. kind of how I hear your question mm. and in this case the answer would be no because these people live in a supported in environment right. yeah. and staff should be aware of things now will we highlight those things that we learned back to them yes exactly. absolutely but i don't believe there was an immediate um no, risk no, no, of self no, of, of no, harm no, to self no, or others no. in this in this in the that, that came up from this study no, no. and then indeed staff were present at yeah. the at the book clubs and exactly and, and they were the one that implemented you know and hopefully we upskilled them right. to continue to provide mm -hmm ebook clubs so even yeah. after the research is done yes um part of our part of this this process um we left the e-readers with participants who who found reading enjoyable we didn't collect them back no. at the end of the study and we had to fight ethics for that because yeah you know they wanted us to collect them all back mm. and we're like no like <laughs> it is our responsibility as yeah. researchers if we introduce something yeah, that is exactly. benefiting them mm. it's it's it, it's 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 unfair to remove that so yeah. um when sometimes when the ethics board pushes you on stuff mm. as a researcher or even as a phd student it's mm. important to push back mm. and have that back and forth conversation mm -hmm. Um, because I think they just didn't see it. They saw it yeah. as an unfair, oh, yeah. unfair incentive, incentive right? Yeah, People exactly. can't afford it. So exactly. if they come and join, then they get it. And mm -hmm. we said, well, if they come and join and they quit, they have to give it back. Mm -hmm. If they don't like it, of exactly. course, give it back, do it mm -hmm. to somebody else. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't remove yeah. something. And that we even we left all, oh, you know, we left extra yeah. just yeah. in case, you know, maybe yeah. other people might want to. So the staff could continue yeah. to provide the programs. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess Martin, to celebrate your research. It's oh, awesome. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank I, you. I think as a, a faculty member supervising students, this is this is the message I hope you get about how joyful research can be. Um, when you're passionate and interested about something, mm -hmm. and how you know, if you structure something in your interest area, um, you can yeah. make a real a real difference for, for people who otherwise. Um, may not have had the opportunity um, to do that. So I, I, yeah. I always love watching you present and just <laughs> makes me happy to yeah. see how happy you are. Yeah. Research, research can be quite joyful if, yes. you, if you design it well. That's so, true. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your support. Because we are third no. You know, I remember when we didn't even have a tool or whatever to use. You were yeah. the one that so brought up the idea that we can improvise, use other means. So, so yeah, thank you. Enough. Yeah. Great. Thank, thank you. you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And the recording will be available on the Tribe website. Mm -hmm. If anybody wants to share it or watch it again. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> thank you. It's thank